Here in Uganda, we are entering the sixth month of the pandemic. No vaccine, no known treatment. Never has there been a more appropriate time to focus on health workers. Rarely have they faced such danger on such a massive scale. It is in times like these that we have learned that we have an obligation to keep frontline health workers everywhere safe, including making sure that they all have the personal protective equipment or PPE they need. All over the world, health workers on the front line are overworked and under-equipped, scared. Some are afraid to go home because they might infect their families. Some are even walking off the job because they don't have PPE, they need to work safely. But for those who have soldiered on up to this date, surely they have a story to tell. This is a CoronaCast, produced with support from the East African Center for Investigative Reporting. I am Kana Ramgume, and this week I speak to Dr. Prosper Ahimsiwe, a frontline health worker in Jinja, Uganda. His fears, anxieties, challenges, and lessons. Um, let's begin by you sharing your experience on how you've been able to be a frontline health worker for more than five months, and you know you're still soldiering on. Yeah, thank, thank you, Canary. I'm, I'm glad to be joining in. Um, yes, I think for me, uh, joining the front line was, uh, you know, uh, uh, for me, a point of, you know, uh, where I saw it was a global pandemic. Um, our healthcare systems were really not prepared to really, uh, you know, handle such a new disease. Of course, I think the only solace that I got was uh, the experience that we've had in managing other deadly viruses like Ebola. And so for me, that sort of, you know, informed my confidence going on the front line. And of course, also from my uh, uh, professional training as a medical doctor. And uh, yes, so initially, uh, you know, the, the, the science wasn't very clear on how it is transmitted. Uh, there was no, of course, vaccine for it. It was a new disease. And, uh, you know, so there was a lot of uncertainties, you know, on the science and on also how to manage it. So... I think uh, what was novel about it, the world was almost uh, uh, at ground zero, being, uh, you know, looking at, you know, developing countries and the developed nations. All of them were beginning from, from square. So for me, I, I saw that as an opportunity for, you know, for, um, you know, for, for countries like, you know, Uganda, DRC that have, you know, been part of Ebola. They sort of had an edge over other countries. And I think it has also shown in, in, in the performance in the, the number of cases that we have had. Okay, so at, my what point, was, uh, at what point did you make the decision and say, you know what, because it was, you know, um, free entry and free exit, no one was forcing you to go and work as a frontline health worker, even though you're a medical doctor, but at what point did you think that this was important for you to join and help the country? But also, you had seen the numbers and how they were surging in other parts of the country, especially outside Africa. So mm. it was scary. Mm. At what point did you sit and think, you know what, I think I need to go into this, even after seeing cases of health workers outside Africa and Uganda uh, contracting the disease and how easy it was for the disease to be passed on, and yet it was so new, not much was known about it. Well, I, I think this comes from uh, right down from my profession. Uh, as a medical student, when you're graduating, you swear an, a Hippocratic oath, which is you have to... Uh, you know, be of service and be there for patients. So for me, it was, uh, it was in my profession. So I wouldn't say it's something that I, I really uh, had to think much. I think also as a, as, as a leader, I think it was also an opportunity to sort of, you know, spearhead the fight against COVID-19. So for me, I just look into my value system and that's what actually informed me being on the front line. Yeah, so this, the five months, I think for me, have been an opportunity one uh, for growth. Uh, in terms of you know uh, new you know uh, into what has been done, uh, for example, the trainings that I have acquired in, in, in infection prevention control, you know that I can sort of even pass on to, to you know to other healthcare workers. I think for me that has been tremendous. Um, so I think I the five months have been you know fast anxiety, but also learning you know to you know you you're dealing with COVID nineteen patients, and every day you have to. You have to be a point of you know of, of information of um, of of you know of, of of healing to them. So I have also had to you know to, to to inform myself to be able to educate them to counsel them 
So for me, I, I just moved from just, uh, it was just beyond, I mean, it's a new thing and, you know, everyone is scared of, you know, of, of getting the severe form of the disease and, you know, um, having a poor outcome. So if you as the health worker are not, you know, doing your best to, to uh, sort of, you know, alleviate, you know, these fears, even with patients, then, uh, I mean, the patient won't get any support from anywhere. So for me, uh, I would say it, it, it's been that for me as well. Okay. And uh, um, what, what does it mean for you uh, health-wise? And it was such a huge risk for you to take, but what does it mean for you health-wise? Are you, are you kung shu and 100% that, you know, when you went into this uh, uh, business of, of treating COVID patients, that you were going to be safe? That was such um, a risk that was exposed to you. I, th- I think the risks were there. I would say, and I think for me as a person, I had to sort of calculate the risk, you know. But I think what uh, came out for me was, you know, I, I, I mean, I've been trained. I think the only, the only, uh, you know, worry I had was the uncertainty of, 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 you know, of how we were going to manage it. But along the way, I think it has shown us that, uh, you know, simple things like, you know, not simple things, but you know, medicines that, you know, like uh, like protocols that have been laid by the Ministry of Health have helped actually most of, uh, of, 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 of our patients to recover. And I would say, I think as Uganda, we've just had about 1,088 recoveries from uh, about 2,900 cases that we have had with uh, 30 deaths, which is very, not a good thing. But these have come in uh, months later down the road. So I, I, for one, well, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to, to applaud, you know, the health workers that have been on the front line and, uh, you know, for the tremendous work because uh, they have been, uh, they have been resilient as I think, I think our resilience as the healthcare system has mostly been from, you know, from the health workers, you know, uh, being there and following, you know, all the, all, all the measures uh, to the dot and making sure that, you know, they, they provide the best of healthcare to the patient. Okay, the, the other thing I wanted to know and what you perhaps might want to share with us is uh, how did your family take this in knowing that there is COVID, you know, in a lockdown, but, you know, our son is out there dealing with COVID patients. How did yeah. your family deal with it? <laughs> it, was, it was, I would say, a moment of, uh, well, I didn't share this with uh, when I applied for, 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 for being to be here. I didn't actually share it with family because I knew it was going to share, it was going to create a lot of it was going to raise a lot of um, uh, you know flags here and there. So it was more of a personal decision. But I think, uh, of course, the fear was that even now it's still there because uh, one of the challenges was I was unable to, for example, be meet with and mingle with family uh, at the start, you know, like freely. Because yeah. I, I was working with patients directly and before we could have all the measures in place and, you know, we have all these frequent tests that are done every two weeks, you know, they test us to see whether we have the virus or not. So I would say for me, um, it, I, I, that affected me in a way, but I think uh, uh, I was able to sort of, you know, pull myself up to, um, you know, sometimes uh, take off, you know, breaks off social media, uh, do some bit of exercise, um, uh, get enough sleep. And uh, yeah, those sort of, you know, you know, kind of kept me, but I, I kept, you know, in touch with family through, uh, you know, you know, calls and, and, and all the other platforms, Zoom. Um, yeah, so I, I would say I got that support from them and I still do get that support from them because I'm still, I'm still on the front line. Okay, and, and you know, there's been something that has not been solved up to date is how yeah. exactly are we able to register recoveries? And what does that mean anyway? Does that mean that the, the virus is out of the body or the body no longer sheds it off? And then also, what is the concoction and the right concoction that, you know, Uganda hospitals or some of the recoveries you've registered in Ginger are using to make sure that people recover mm. from COVID? Um, yeah. So, well, uh, I think the first was, um, well, uh, about the concoction. Uh, well, I think one is, uh, is we've had, the, the, I think from the start, we've had uh, mild cases of, uh, of, of the disease. I think that has been, of course, and I think this has sort of created, a, uh, I wouldn't say, a, 
it's it's only you know the demographic of that. It's how it has been presenting because we've, we've initially had the young people, you know, before, from about twenty to thirty, you know, years, forty years who, you know, have slightly a better immunity than, you know, people who are 60 and above. So I would say that has sort of created a false sense of, of hope, you know, uh, that we're actually doing well. It's just that the demographics of, of who it has affected has been in, uh, in young people. But I think now we're seeing that's because now uh, it has come to, it is community spread, you know, and uh, around, you know, across, I think, Uganda, not even Kampala alone, but of course there are spikes in Kampala. Uh, and this, of course, uh, is now it's, it's now moving to even the elderly and people with the, uh, underlying comorbidities. So I think that's why we're beginning to see the death. So I would say uh, the most important thing why I would say people should protect themselves and put on a mask and sanitize is to just prevent, you know, them giving it to you know to to their you know elderly you know parents or friends or community people in the community. Who are not as strong as them, you know. Okay, so, yeah. so uh, on, on your second question, yeah, yeah, my second question was, um, what was does it mean to recover from COVID? What, what scientific? Oh. What, what is it like? Is it? What I know it you gain it you gain immunity um, after recovering from COVID. That if you recover today, that tomorrow you might have a chance that you might get it. Yeah, I think there's been a discussion on reinfection. I think what you're trying to say, can someone get reinfected? Yeah. And I think for me, yes, people have sort of gotten the virus, you know, they have, they have, you know, when you get, when you, when you, when you diagnose as positive, the body builds antibodies towards the virus. So meaning uh, for the, for the second infection, if you're to get reinfected, uh, you, you're going to have a better immune response. So you're not going to get with a severe form of disease. You're going to fight it off. That is what actually happens even when you have a vaccine. When you get a vaccine, you're inoculated. Uh, you, so your body builds a, a sort of soldiers towards the virus. So you're not going to get, you're not going to suffer the severe form of, of that disease. Um, so uh, I would say the only challenge is we don't have serology tests at the moment, which are tests that test for antibodies. You know, if yeah. we're able to uh, to actually get those tests, I think we'd even discover people who have, you know, sort of, you know, you know, uh, had you know, you know, they because of the limited testing capacity, they have gotten it and they have recovered and they have antibodies. So I would say that that for me is another great area for for science. I would say both here and even in in, in other countries. Okay. Um, yeah. So what, is, what did what what has your experience taught you during this period of time? Um, and what are some of, of the new things that you've learned about? COVID, uh, especially dealing with patients oh. that you did not know, as we conclude. So, uh, one, I would say, first and foremost, I think I have realized that, you know, health workers are a very strong pillar how, of, of a healthcare system. And I would say more investment needs to happen, you know, to equip health workers, you know, to further their studies, to invest in them, you know. Uh, and I think what came out is like, uh, you know, initially at the start, health workers had to move, you know, from distant areas to these isolation units. Some even had to stay there. So I think investment needs to happen, you know, so that, you know, there are units for health workers to be close to health, you know, centers so they can be able to deliver healthcare. Um, and I would say that, that you know, we, 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 we sort of, um, and I think that's what has, you know, come out that, you know, you know that that if we didn't have you know well-trained doctors and nurses who who are courageous, who are you know who show up every day for their work, yeah, uh, I think would have a, a much bigger disaster. And I think it it has also laid bare uh, the other learning. It has also laid bare of the inefficiencies we have in the healthcare system. For example, emergency care and critical care, which is one ambulances. You know, we had mothers who are not get, getting to hospitals because of you know, lockdown measures, they couldn't get a car. So there has to be investment in things like ambulances that are able to transport, you know, people and equipping them as well. Uh, critical care, I think we've seen the, the, the ministry, you know, reinforcing most of the regional referrals with the ventilators, which has, it's unfortunate it has come in about six months, you know, since we started. So, uh, but I think it's, it's going to be a, a good thing moving forward because now we're able to manage the severe cases which I think with, with where we are, uh, we are, we are seeing the severity of, of, of COVID and, and, the, and, the, and the mortality rising. Uh, then the other thing, there's been sort of a breakdown of, of uh, risk you know, communication. 
and uh, I would say from you know both you know health officials and and just the public. So one of the learnings has been that it's very important you know to have credible sources of information in times like these you know of a pandemic. So yeah. as to want to, to to you, I mean you work in the media, you know how dangerous misinformation can be, you know. But I think it's it's very important to you know to sort of you know communicate that so that we have you know for such a pandemic we have people complying you know uh, you know to think you know to just putting on mask. I feel very disappointed when I walk out of my place to go and work and I see someone they're not putting on a mask and I it's always a question that I have and I wonder like oh why why don't they because you know when the front line we try to you know to to sort of keep COVID out and then people are just walking you know the way they are so. But I think it's sort of, you know, you have to look into how do we communicate the risk? How do we get everyone on board, you know, in, in, in the fight against COVID? Um, then the other thing that I want to end with, which is, uh, I think, as an innovator as well, is uh, I think I've seen the rise of innovations, you know, and the use of them, you know, and, and, and them coming from us as, as Uganda in yeah. the fight against COVID, which I think is something that is very commendable. And I would want to see that conversation, you know, of, of innovations and healthcare progressing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and lastly, you know, under just one minute, what are your thoughts about the newly introduced uh, fees or, of, of testing for COVID-19, 240,500? Uh, it has brought a storm on social media and people bashing government and the Ministry of Health for doing such a thing. What, what are your own thoughts as a medical practitioner? I would say it's a bit very unfortunate because now the econ- economies are beginning to open up and people, you know, have to sort of travel for some people who do international business and it's a requirement to have a COVID-19 pass. So it's, it's, it's unfortunate that people are going to have to pay, you know, in times like this where people have been locked down and they don't have resources. So it, for me, it brings in an issue of, of health, you know, equity and justice, you know. Uh, does every, you know can everyone afford you know you know the 245 you know especially for people who have been hit you know badly by covid especially economically so i think those are things that maybe government should put into perspective uh and see whether it can sort of you know can if if because it's unfortunate yes they are doing testing for you know for other contacts and and everyone but i think that cost can be subsidized so that you know at least more ugandans especially those who actually uh, are most vulnerable can be able to access, you know, uh, this this test. So I think, uh, and of course, this also, you know, brings in into the issue of vaccine. So what will happen when the vaccine is rolled out? Is it something that people will have to pay for? Because I think if if we are now paying for the test, then what happens to the vaccine? So I think for me, it's just be it, it has to be very careful and know that this is a global pandemic. It has affected all of us, and I think. That fee is, is, is a figure that I, I don't think most Ugandans would be able to afford uh, for that test. So I, I think it's a bit unfortunate, or, or, you know, when you look at it in terms of, you know, health equity and justice and access to, to health care. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Prosma, for sharing your mind. This has been a very, very interesting discussion. And uh, stay safe and, and keep, keep the fight on. And, and thanks for you Thank- teaching your health and, and life to save people's lives. Thank you, Kanari, for also being on the front line in the media. And uh, thank you for hosting me. Thanks for listening to the CoronaCast this week. The CoronaCast is produced with support from the East African Center for Investigative Reporting. For more information, visit our website, voxpopuli.com. We'll see you next week.